Hi, welcome to the 128th episode of my podcast, Currency. Um, I'm going, I, I just need to uh, be more forthright. What do I want to say? What do I have to say? I don't need to do anything. I don't need to be better. Like, it's always about, like, goals or getting better or progress or something. I think that that... It's, it's kind of a, I mean, it's good. You have to mark your progress to know. Otherwise, you won't really know. You have to mark your progress. Like, you have to keep accounts of when people compliment you. So you're like, oh, I did well in this area. So I know I'm headed in the right direction. That's what I need to do is um, believe people when they compliment me. People will give me a lot of compliments doing stand-up. Um, you don't know that they're all like, which ones are just, like, facetious, but, um, <clears throat> lots of people have complimented me, and, but I will spend most of the time just, like, God, I'm horrible at this, you know, um, troubles, women, women's troubles that I have, you know, um, insecurity and doubting yourself, are, that's for women, that's not for men for because women all have that like psychology thing going on where it's like women's intuition you know i i think that's how it works women like own psychiatry and like knowing about the ins and outs of the psyche because they have women's intuition um is that how it works i'm just paranoid about what is women's intuition i'm confused where why did they why do they own that but um, I understand it because it's like, I think that women are more intuitive. They're not really that intuitive. I think that, I think that uh, nobody is intuitive, but everybody wants to be intuitive, or at least in this era, this psychiatry, like everybody's a, everybody is a psychiatrist. And um, even the people that aren't. I mean, I, it feels like we're still in that. And, like, women are more intuitive, but they're, nobody's that, nobody's intuitive. Nobody knows what's going on in another person's mind. I think the, I think we give ourselves too much credit for thinking we know other people. I think that uh, we don't know other people. But it's just that men are so unintuitive that women's intuition, obviously, because they're at least, like, better because men have, like, no intuition at all, I think. I mean, it varies. Some men are more like women and therefore are intuitive. It's just a harmful stereotype to women to call them intuitive, I think. It's, I mean, it's sexist against men. Men, like, uh, I'm just making the case that no man should really... Um, want to have intuition at least in accordance with like being manly it's just not really manly to have intuition i i don't think not in this age not not anymore it's defunct men used to, it's like men just probably posture and intimidate i don't think that they know anything I don't think women know anything either about the other person. It's everybody just like, in order to have power, you pretend that you know something that the other person doesn't, I think, is as far as, I mean, yeah, people are like intuitive or they're, I, I mean, it's not really men or women, I don't think. Some people are just like really good at defining other people like too exactly. It's to the point that it's scary. I don't think that I possess that quality. I did when I was like 23, but that's when I was more of a child. When I was 23, I thought I knew everything about everyone. Now I know that I know nothing about whoever. So, I mean, I don't know that women are intuitive or not. They are more intuitive than men, I think. In conclusion. And, um, why are men not intuitive? Not for boring reasons. For boring, unintuitive, 
obvious reasons um, that I won't go into because for the reasons being that they are obvious. Imagine if I died tragically and imagine if I died on, in a car accident and then they put a the symbol of another man where I died for everybody to see it, put it there permanently for it's like, this will be here forever until further notice unless until somebody steals it or it deteriorates the symbol of another man, that would be insanity. But that's actually the world that we live in. Um, interestingly enough, it happens often. Somebody dies and then they put a cross. Somebody dies on the roadways. They put a cross where they died, I guess just cause like the theme of intersections and crosses like Jesus like why are why is crosses so much more popular for tragic roadway accidents than for like other accidents like if somebody died during surgery they don't put a cross in the hospital room permanently I guess because it's like owned by the government or it's owned by some but like isn't the road owned by the government since when are you allowed to just place crap on the side of the road I'm not saying like the cross is crap, but the wooden planks that they used for it uh, by themselves is generally useless, worthless. It's not worth a lot. Um, but And then it's just like there forever. And it's, it's for Christian people. It's not for the person that died. It's like, it's essentially Jesus got a point Jesus scored Jesus because Jesus keeps living and you died. And this is the point where you died and where you lost to Jesus because Jesus is still alive as far as we're counting his years and whatever. Um, score another point. Jesus dunked on you totally over here and now you're dead and Jesus got another point. So right over here where this idiot died and didn't make it. I don't want, I would want my symbol to be like, put my symbol I don't have a symbol but like definitely if I die don't put the cross on my gravestone if anybody hears this don't put a cross if I die in a car accident do not put a cross out there that is the least way that you could honor me and and um I will not rest in peace if that happens I mean I hope that I would anyway you know I I hope that I'd be able to get over it right like that shouldn't be a deal breaker like oh you don't get to go to an afterlife just because you had this like um agenda like this grudge about like i will not rest in peace if you put a cross where i died um i uh, sure i'll rest in peace but just like could you honor don't put a cross on my gravestone if i die normally don't put a cross don't associate a cross anything with my death um i would prefer to have my own symbol that's like the opposite of a cross just to be honest um like you can't just put a symbol of another of another man that lived They're like you got because that's so like you lost and they won um obviously obviously it's absurd to put another man's symbol in in the death spot of somebody who died that's like really disrespectful um and it irrationally just like in rational terms but because it's like really popular it's not it's not irrational because the cross is popular people are like yeah we're gonna put a cross yeah where this idiot teenager died uh-huh that's what jesus is for that's exactly what it's for it's to prove prove people wrong when they got drunk or whatever they died and made an accident jesus didn't make any accidents look at his legacy in comparison to yours so the best we can do for you is try to associate you with somebody better than you at this point another point for jesus zero for you fucked hard try to live next time and i'm being serious like might not sound might not sound serious that like fairty golf analyst scottish or scott scottish and golf analyst way of talking what's going on in the world why are we doing this i mean not golf analyst but just scottish it's time to get out of here. I lost a bed and a, as a result, I contracted leprosy. I'm not that funny. It's, it's not that, it's not that I'm 
I gotta go and do stand up and compete with TikTok. It's we're losing. We're losing the battle. I'm in the trenches doing stand up in public. Like I we're losing comedy is losing the battle. No no offense to stand up comedy. But TikTok is a lot funnier than some than stand up. You just go to stand up it if it's an open mic, you're just going there to see people get nervous and fuck up and like fail miserably. Is my opinion on it. I know, actually, I mean, that's not the way, like, at least, ha that's not the way, like, half of the people feel about it. That's the way I feel as someone doing it. It's like, I think these people would prefer, because they, if they want to see something funny, like, just go on the internet. No, nothing I, like, yeah, 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 there's people that are funny, there's people that are funnier than me, and, like, obviously it sounds like I'm complaining, because, like, I'm not, like, I make people laugh, I'm not saying that. No, nobody laughs at me because they're because the internet's better. Um, people will laugh at me, but um, I think that people go to stand up just to see uh, weirdos and clowns, and um, that's what I can provide for. That's what I have the ability to provide. It's like I'm gonna say something that's just like, oh, mm, we don't like it. I it I, I at least I hope to. At least I hope to. But it's just narcissism, folks. It's just... <sighs> Sorry for about, um... Sorry about narcissism. People hate narcissism. People hate, like, you don't get to be... We all decided that everybody's a regular person, dude. You don't get to say things like you're from somewhere else. Like, we all decide, we banish that. It's irrelevant. That's not popular anymore. You don't get to say things like you have something. And um, I think that this new, whatever is going on now, like the woke mind virus, they just don't like somebody saying things that they don't understand like they don't like somebody who's being funny like it's the same as people hating clowns um if you're being funny that's like people don't like that even even in um like it's an era where we're interpreting funny to be horrific like the scary kind of funny like you're just strange if you're funny that's what it that's exactly what it is in this era if you're funny we don't want it it's it's the same as like we decided clowns are so scary or whatever and um so it's like is that the future then we're just gonna out outlaw funny more and more until it's gone um no it's not the future because the funny people are the people saying the weirdo things that are like undefinable and that will last it's just like they're People want to prohibit that kind of behavior now that's not going to last forever. We'll swing back into a more liberal mindset and then those people will be celebrated. It's just like the conservatives don't like funny people. Even though that's like conservatives meme. And maybe I'm saying more like Christians. Maybe it's, maybe it's none of those. It's just this era is wary of the funny, I think. And... comes through in commercials or whatever. Preference. Uh, preference. 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 Yeah. Preference. Why was I doing that? I was doing that because I preferred to do it. I preferred to do this. How underrated is preference? Because um, the bar is so low with preference. Like, it's so convenient. Um... Like, when the Pilgrims came over here, they had a few of their buzzwords you might recognize. Where it's like, they had some of their slang shit that, that, that was so popular at the time. Like, Providence and whatever else. Mayflower. Providence, uh, God's Divine Intervention. Quaker. Like, Quaker is like, oh, we're, like, they're trying to capitalize on some trend something cool like we're the quakers yeah i mean um providence would have been like a word i feel like progress is the 
providence of today. 1600s, it was providence. Today, it's progress. Like, this really good political word, I mean, equality or diversity is the thing today. But, like, back in 1600s, they had the exact same energy of that. They were just using different words to describe it. And so it's like, providence was like a new, mind-boggling, mind-blowing idea to them, is what I would imagine, that they're, like, naming their most important city, Providence, or like one of their most important cities that, the capital of Rhode Island today. Pro Providence, we don't, doesn't get a lot of play now. It's to the point that we don't even remember that Providence is a word for providence. Um, and that's what I'm saying is like providence, they were like, whoa, God provides, and they're really into God. Like that anything provides, they're like providence in a way that we could not recapture that we don't understand today because we're like, it's irrelevant now. We don't give a fuck about Providence. That Providence peaked already. Uh, progress and preference is a future one. I think that people are not, don't understand how positive it is. Like this is something that can be mind blowing to people in the same way that progress is mind blowing to people. It's mind blowing because they can't get over it. People keep using it to be like, I mean, progressive is just such a prevail is a prevailing political ideology. You know that it's really popular. If that's the case, if we if we're using the word to describe major political groups, um, then that's a really popular word that's blowing people's minds. Or whatever. This is like a this is a phenomenon. Progress and uh, preference is one maybe that hasn't peaked yet because because of how convenient it is. Um, it's the same as like ease of living, like make it easy for yourself, make it more comfortable. Why just always do the thing that you prefer, not the thing that um, makes you look like a something, not the thing that makes you look like the title, something more pretentious, I mean, appearancist. Preference goes beyond, it's just like preference is so easy. Because it's like doing the thing that you prefer just starts with you and starts right where you're at every time. It's just like right in front of you, preference is. It's right in front of you. It's always like, can you do the preferred option? Because it's not easy to do the preferred option, but it's such an it's such a good category, such a good area of life because of comparison of options. Because you have so many options, especially in this world, of like what you'd watch on the internet alone. And um, doing what you prefer, either watching YouTube videos or going out and doing something, is really an undervalued skill set. Preference is so nothing that it's like um, you can just go. You can just go into it. It's not um, doesn't take a lot of effort, which is just the exactly the kind of thing that people are looking for in their lives. Um, preference, like I'll, I'll just do the preferred one. Not and that it simplifies it so much. Preferred thing of all of the options, go down the preferred route because it's like it's a good skill to try to be able to do that. Um, choose the thing that you prefer. I mean, just the ability to pick things, just the ability to choose what you want, so that you know that you're doing what you want. Is it an important? It's an important thing, maybe that people should think more about. But it's like, it's profound because thinking about preference is more preferred. Like you'd have to, you'd have to focus on it more to get your thoughts organized, get your thoughts going in the right direction. Like, um, it's, it's preferred to, to consider the idea of preference. Um, I mean, preference is just, is preferable as a tool, as something that you can use, like it's something that people should use more to help like govern their lives, that they don't. And the reason that they don't is because it's not like this buzzword, it's not a phenomenon where people are like, preference. We need to, we need to do what we prefer because prefer is just like not a big word. It doesn't even have a big like sound to it. It's kind of light, prefer, doesn't, it's like the bar is as low as that. It's just like doing what you prefer. It's just like so, um, 
it's kind of simple, but like getting getting it so that you're thinking in that direction is is preferred to not doing that. And it's really so this is to the point that I'm like why would you ever go without preference if you're always doing what you want? Only if you were saying that what you want isn't always best, but for a world that's like do what you want the most, try to do what makes you happiest, as long as it's that, preference is an underutilized description um, that you can use to at least accompany that idea of like trying to bring about the most happiness only comes through like these small little actions, small positive steps. And that's like, preference gets really into the minutia like that. Like um, the little steps because doing what you prefer kind of happens every second. I Or I mean, it could, but like just that you're doing something every second. Preference is a specific and intelligent enough word, I'd say, that it gets into the minutia of all the little deci decisions you make. So it's like, it's kind of hard to ignore if you realize the importance of it. Um, preference doing what you doing what you prefer preferring because it's not a big what i'm saying is that it's not it's not for big decisions but i guess it is for big decisions as well but doing what you doing what you prefer like you're, like you're kind of doing what you prefer anyway like if you but it's it's the more the more that you would be able to describe the small decisions you're making, the more specific you're able to get with it is the more that you would be able to manipulate those decisions in like a positive direction. The more intelligent you are to recognize like that all of your decisions are different from each other, which is like, it's craziness, insanity. If you actually like really go into it where you're like, now I, now I walk out the door, but do I want to go exactly this direction, uh, this many degrees, or do I want to take this angle of approach when I walk to my car or whatever could go into insanity, of course. But like, um, just the more that you recognize that every decision you make is different is the smarter you're being, but it's like smarter is not always the best thing. And so that's would be the case against preference is that intelligence isn't always the best because sometimes it's better to be dumb so that you don't have to think about all of the things you're doing that you would like do every day. But um, it becomes stupider the more that you identity politics your decisions, put them under one category. The more that um, everything is under one category is the dumber that it is because you're just reducing all of your actions to like one, like driving to work encounter you encounter like a hundred decisions from when you wake up at least that depending on how many you want to get into describing you encounter like a hundred decisions from when you wake up to when you at the point to then when you're at work and you've driven there you might call like all the driving to work but like the more that you just play it give all of it one identity is the more that you're just saying all of those decisions are the same thing they're just one category the more that you're making it stupid but I, I think that, and so it's, it, since we live in a world where people are forced to follow recursive pathways, it's good to be dumb. Um, definitely. If we lived in a world that was more freedom of movement, where it's like, I'll live in a, one city this year, and then another city this year, and then another city this year, which it's like, why wouldn't that be possible? Uh, it's not possible because people are like, uh, traditional and stuck with their families and want to stay by their families and people are given over to identities. The world is not unidentified enough. If it, if it was an unidentified world, you could live in a different city every year or whatever. People want, people are really stuck in this very superstitious way that it will become, identities will become more decentralized over time. And, um, right now there, it's very identity politics world because you're like, you live in the same city for seven years. You live in the same house for seven years or whatever. Um, because that's just the way that it is. And it's because people are given over to 
identities, and that's because it's that's because people aren't given credit for like changing frequently. They're just called chameleons or or fakers or whatever. Uh, fakeness isn't accepted. Reality, realness is you have to be real, and real is stupid because the more real it is, the more like identifiable and obvious it is. Um, Got to be real. Real is dumb, and and literalists literalists love real, but it's like the more specific that you get. Um, it's the more that you have more and more categories that you're describing. If you're really going to go to be, and you're going to go as intelligent as saying everything is different that you do, it's more intelligent. I don't know that I could say, like, that's better. It's not better in this world, because this world is so given to identities, but it's like, progressively, futuristically, it is better. It will grow to be that one day. This is a futuristic thing. I, unidentification is more futuristic. Unidentity. Identity is what we do now. In the future, identity, the uh, these big groups, these big categories that we'll put over all of our decisions will be decentralized into all of the decisions as we become more intelligent. We'll become more intelligent as we merge with uh, robots and technology, for one. Um, just as we've done, just as we're like, monumentally more intelligent now than we used to be because we have access to so much information because of our smartphones. Um, we are continuing to progress, progress in that way. And um, eventually preference will suit something like preference will supersede terms like progress just because preference is this more intelligent thing. And I'm, I'm letting you know what's on the horizon. Um, because preference helps you get to that place where you're calling every decision different. Um, and it's more helpful to you to call everyone different uh, as far as optimal convenience is concerned. To optimally convenience yourself, you have to consider preference because like preference discerns between everything, you know? It discerns between a thousand different options. Like it's it, uh, divi divining divines between them um whenever you want to consider it whenever you want to use it some words just have such amazing utility like that um preference uh i don't know and and it's like go with the preferred probabilities too not just I mean, you'd have to consider a number of factors what did you want what you want is different from what you prefer want is different from what you prefer because prefer implies other options like prefer implies this world of um comparisons and possibilities which is what the world is it's just that you're being stupid if you want to make it a world that there's only one possibility there aren't very many of them and um <laughs> um if you want to make it that there's if you want to recognize the real world you're going to recognize a bunch of possibilities like um i don't know preference will preference will get you there pref use preference preference implies but that it's different from what you want because like what would you prefer versus what you want it's important to separate something like that too like Preference maybe doesn't emerge as a prevailing phenomenon in, in terms of like, and I'm saying it would be a phenomenon if people were using it very popularly. So it was used, circulated a lot, like currency, like money, or currency, or money, currency, dollars, or not dollars, rub rubles, rubies, rubles, diamonds, currencies, Magic the Gathering cards, that's a currency. Everything's a currency. But it's like people should invest in Magic the Gathering cards more than the U.S. dollar because Magic the Gathering cards at least stabilize. The U.S. dollar has nosedived for the last century with no end in sight for the nosediving. Why are people investing so much in dollars? It doesn't even make any sense when there's 10 million different currencies you can invest in. Jordans, guitars, guns. Like... Why the fuck are people investing in the U.S. dollar? And... What I prefer that is different from you... 
pre preference is a more intelligent term than wanting. Wanting is just more generalizing, like, this is what I want. It's, it's harder to figure out what you want if you're not using better descriptions, like, well, how, what do you prefer? Like, choose one option over, over another is what makes you what you are. Like, that's, that's how good it is. That's how helpful it is. It's like, it really um, man could manifest somebody's individuality, like help somebody express that, make their individuality come out. Preference can, because it gives you the options that are better, like versus it makes, uh, helps you eliminate options you don't want. And um, it's very intelligent like that. It can bring out intelligence in you be preferred uh i mean probably if you're considering all of the th you'll probably be more preferred person overall objectively for the rest of the world to see if you're doing what you prefer more often you want to bring that character onto yourself have it happen for you you know um make yourself a more preferred person like bring that prefer preference energy towards you i think is a good idea um it's a good idea my March Madness brackets are all fucked. Not all of them, but um, I had Auburn winning most of the time. And Auburn lost in the first round at Yale. And let me express how I feel about that as somebody who's like heavily invested in March Madness all the time. Um, and the reason I'm invested in it is because of the brackets I make, not because of like a team I like the most, even though I like the Badgers a lot and they were playing in March Madness, and they also lost in the first round. So that's like double sucks. Um, it's liking the Badgers and liking my brackets are two, it's a two headed monster of why I like March Madness. Both of those things are like even to me. And both of those I lost in a single day in the first round when I could generally expect that the joy, the expectation of, of my joy for March Madness will continue for a while, or like my bracket and Wisconsin will last for multiple rounds of the March Madness. But anyways, I picked Auburn. They lost in the first round. They got upset by Yale, and I, I don't, I don't really care in retrospect. I, I don't care so much right now as I would have if it had happened when I was younger. I've gotten older and wiser. Um, Auburn got raped by the refs the entire game. I'm not going to use that as an excuse my excuse is just like it it happens everybody march madness whatever um there's really nothing it didn't seem like there was anything auburn could do because the refs were against them and the refs ejected one of their starters three minutes into the game and um it's not that the refs have an agenda going in it's just like once the game starts and they realize like and they're just like listening to the crowd they get lost in it I, I mean or whatever it is they're trying to help out one of the teams they the refs just become like sympathetic to one of the teams and then make that team their cause because refs i think are like have problems being overly emotional like these people that get in this position where like you're just being famous for being hated by people like there's something wrong with you i think these i think that they're like some of the most emotional among us but like they're they're horrible at their job and the worst part is that the broadcasters act like they're great at their job and give them credit at every turn and it's like when you when i'm seeing that in comparison to my life i wish that like you know referees get hated but they don't really because the broadcasters love the shit out of them every minute that they're on the air and um at least the pro refs and the it's it's just a lot of a lot of bullshit that's happening I, I would say that with the with the referees um that's not exactly the reason they the teams i wanted lost the reason they lost is because they're like wisconsin lost because they're on the road and they're bad on the road all the time and what they got was a road game even though it's like a it's supposed to be a neutral court but they were playing close enough to james madison that the crowd was all james madison but i mean the committee needs to not try to give wisconsin the worst situation like they they're like we're gonna give them a marquee they wanted a marquee matchup so instead of just giving wisconsin a random team they gave them somebody with a name um james madison somebody who's on the east coast and then made them play in brooklyn new york and that's just something that they're doing for money and ratings 
And uh, Wisconsin, James Madison is a good matchup. It's a better sounding matchup than every other 5-12 matchup. And 5-12 is a really marquee seed matchup for the first round. Um, and so they wanted a good... They wanted a good uh, region for Brooklyn because the the team that Wisconsin would have been playing is Duke, and then the other they're playing uh, the winner of Duke Vermont, and Duke Vermont is another good college basketball matchup for Brooklyn New York that they're airing on CBS, not on one of their alternative ones. They didn't air it on TNT or TBS. They did it. They're airing James Madison Wisconsin and Duke Vermont on CBS uh, because they're like this is the one we want for ratings, and so. Whatever it was, when they seeded it, they were like, they didn't give Wisconsin some random team. Um, not that they singled out Wisconsin, but they needed somebody. They needed a marquee matchup for their CBS Brooklyn, New York, whatever. Um, and they did the same thing when they gave Wisconsin Oregon as a 12 seed a, f a few years ago, like four or five years, three, four years ago. <laughs> Don't give... Don't give us Oregon as a 12 seed. I'm still more angry about that than James Madison, but um, I'm starting to get sick, and so I'm trying to get this uh, podcast in before I get sick. I'm so excited about the sickness that's coming on. But uh, maybe uh, if I talk about something interesting, so I'm sipping this Tim Hortons to try to prevent the sickness, but the sickness started just last night, so I'm right at the beginning of it, and um, it's a question of how long will it last, how bad is it going to get at this point, because I know that I have not faced the worst of it, so I'm in a tough position right now. Um, I am just trying to use this, this last day to get something done. God has granted me the freedom to not be shackled to March Madness anymore, since all of my ties to it have been broken, and not all of them, but I still have some good brackets. I can still win all of my pools, and I'll let you know if I do. Um, everybody has a story, and notice how the story is so much different from the thing that happened. And I don't mean that people, em not just that people embellish stories, which they do, but that the story is just a bunch of words. Like, recounting a memory that happened is so much different from actions that are happening. The story is so much different because it has... The thing that happened was nothing like a bunch of words that someone was saying. The thing that happened wasn't just, like, sentences only. I mean, it could be like you're, like, recounting a memory of somebody said something. But even that is like an action that then it impacts everybody who hears it at the time in this certain way. And uh, I guess you retell the story, you try to recapture that same impact. But it's just like the thing that happens is so spontaneous or it's like something that's worth a story is uh, so spontaneous. But then like the story is just like words that somebody is saying. And... That is to say that, I don't know, it's not that like, it's not that people embellish stories, it's that when you have a story, it's, it's often like if I have something that's worth a story like retelling, it's for something that I would have not even considered to be a story when it happened. It's like a lot of stories are it's like you wouldn't have known it was a story. To call it a story at the time that it happened wouldn't make any sense. Uh, and so in that way, stories are kind of like superficial. Not And people would say like stories are superficial just because people lie or because they embellish them. But it's like, it's, an, it's a lie immediately because it's not... You're retelling something in a completely different context with different people than how it happened. It's like... It's so different, and, um, like, what's the significance of that? It's just, like, it's weird how you, it's weird how the stories you have are, like, you didn't know that they were. 
you didn't know that they were that at the time. The stories, the stories you have, but it's like everybody, everybody has a story and not everybody should have one because I don't know. It's like forcing a story. Forcing a story. A lot of the coaches that win in March Madness are... The teams that win in March Madness have, like, the most emotionally manipulative head coach. Like, the guy... The head coach that's, like, lying to his players the best in order to get them to that special place so they can, like, have confidence to win in a single elimination tournament. Like, a lot of the teams that win in March just have a coach that is very good at being emotionally manipulative. That's all that head coaching is. In basketball, it's just like it's crazy how much it's about just like the the coaches put it trying to create this fake world where it's like you're where he's trying to tell their team that they're all superstars, and the coach that's the most successful at lying to their team is the coach that's going to win. So they're all kind of weird. The all the head coaches of college basketball teams are all like weirdos, and they have to have this like coach's persona, and you better choose a good one like I don't know what's happening in March Madness nowadays I think that there's something going on where you have to be on the ref's side in order to win the game you have to like buddy up to them and like talk to them a lot to win the March Madness games that's that's what I'm seeing a lot of these teams that win is that uh they're talking to the refs or they have this like relationship with the refs maybe like love hate but they like buddy up to them talk to them a lot so that the refs are never giving the teams that win it's like the refs never give them an offensive foul the entire game and that's not the way that it was 15 years ago at all like the refs would call turnovers and offensive fouls out of the blue on either team but it's like the teams that the refs are pit are the teams that are winning are like teams that the refs are overlooking all the shit that happens on their end and that's just like I'm watching that happen over and over again. It has to do with the way that the coach talks to the referees and talks to their players. But like Matt Painter does it. Matt Painter has this weird relationship with the refs where he's like always talking with them whether he gets a call or doesn't get a call. Purdue complains about everything that the refs do, whether they're getting calls or not. And that is to their benefit because the refs like attention. And... um they get a lot of attention and said like this is the emerging era of college basketball is like you have to have a team that is not ashamed of like selling out to the refs it's the same as the way that we see soccer is going in the world unfortunately it sucks um sports were better when people had decency where players weren't like trying to flop or whatever like soccer was better when everybody wasn't flopping but any world cup you see now whatever world cup is next time the world cup is happening I think in two years, there will be more flopping than the previous one because that's just the trajectory of it. It's like people are flopping more and more to try to get the refs to give them a call. And especially in soccer, when the game is decided on a, if you're given a free kick or not, basically. And and it's we see it happening in college basketball the, the same way. I think that that's like completely, lo completely logical. Um, it's the teams that are just like buddying up to the refs or winning a lot. And, um, but it's like the, the head coaches, like Matt Painter's coach's persona, Purdue's head coach's persona is like sucks, but he doesn't, I think the era is done where you had to have a cool coaching persona. That's why all the cool ones are quitting like coach K and North Carolina's coach. What is his name? Roy Williams? I think. I've already forgotten. Just a couple of years out, out, he's out of the league. Um, I mean, Bruce Pearl has a cool coach's persona where he's always, like, looks exasperated. And that's not... There's not as much value in that anymore. Like, Calipari's coach's persona is... I mean, a lot of them all look, like, exasperated, but, like... Bruce Pearl is, like, sweating through his suit every time, so he's, like, going even further. He has a really cool coach's demeanor, and that's why I was picking Auburn to win, and they lost. And um, Tom Izzo 
it's the same thing. Like Izzo's coaching demeanor, he's such a liar. It's all his persona. You have to be such a fake, such a clown to be a head coach in college basketball. But it's like there used to it used to be. I I think what's happening now is you don't need a coach's persona. You just gotta bitch to the refs. Uh, great guards coach's persona. I like it. He's he is a clown. He's a funny looking guy. He kind of looks like Louis C.K. And um, there's no reason to hate on him for losing in the first round. You have to remember that they won the Big Ten regular season the year that they had COVID and didn't have March Madness. And you don't know at all what would have happened that time. And Greg Gard has won one, two, three, four. Greg Gard is four and two in first round games. So... Until that gets a lot worse, you can't really fire him. In today's college basketball, it's completely random. Whether you win or lose, like everybody is kind of the same amount of good. You really can't hate the guy for... If he's making it to the tournament, good. And what happens there is just like you get unlucky a lot in uh, in March Madness. So I don't fire Greg Gard. Um, he's fine. Greg Gard's not doing anything except that he should be more emotionally manipulative manipulative to both his players and the refs. But the Wisconsin Badgers are just mentally ill. Besides that the state of Wisconsin is is mentally ill. Um, everybody has a story, but they need not. Everybody's got a story. It's just like when I have a story, I'm like, oh, that's definitely a story that's worth telling the same as other stories that I've heard before. I don't know. Even when I was thinking about, I don't know what I'm getting at with this, so I guess I'll, I guess I'm not. No, I won't go into it because I couldn't figure out what I was getting at beforehand. But um, it's just that, it's not that we embellish stories, that's not why there are lies. It's because it's not, the thing that happened is not a story for anyone. It only is in a world that's like governed by history or um, clout because people can't just accept when something happens. It's just like a lot of the things that are stories that are, that'll get laughs that I've told. Like if I tell a story that's like funny, that's like, oh, that's a really good story. It's like, it was so nothing when it happened. It's so, a lot of the story, at least this is my experience with it, is that a lot of the stories I have were so insignificant when they happened, where it's just like, this is obviously something that happens in the world. But it's just like, for some reason, looking back, you realize like, oh, if I described it, that's something that people would really like to hear. That's the way that I feel about it anyway. Is that like, when the significant things happen, I mean, maybe I'm just, like, I'm not really surprised by a lot. So, like, it doesn't seem significant, a lot of the stories. But I feel like it's got to be like that for everyone or for a lot of people. Is that, like, the stories you end up telling are were just kind of, like, dumb. I mean, they're just kind of like anything at the time that it actually happened. Like, when I see something that's more extraordinary... I don't freak out. Maybe that's what I'm describing. I don't... Like, you see something out in the world, like, that's obviously something more extraordinary, like somebody getting into a car crash or something. Like, to me, when it happens, it's just like... It's just like... I might know that it'll be a memory that lasts longer because it's so because it's sig more significant. Like I can tell that it's more significant. It's just that like it's not like we need to whatever um sensationalize tragedy, which is just exactly what we do in the world. It's not it's not like we need to sensationalize Do we need to sensationalize the extraordinary things? I guess. It's just like, they're not that significant and it's not that 
great. So like what makes something extraordinary or, or whatever? Extraordinary things happen. And, uh, but I mean, and so in that regard, they're not that extraordinary. And it's just that the ordinary is so, of course, the extraordinary has to happen when so many things are ordinary. So it's really just kind of like logical that extraordinary things happen. Even though like, yeah, they are extraordinary. That doesn't mean that they're irrational. They're like significant things, special things happen. And so you would be a liar if you were like, everybody is regular, nothing new happens under the sun. New things, the things that are new are like when the player, I think Donovan Edwards, I want to say Edwards. I I might be getting the name wrong. The guy that dunked over the Utah Jazz player, the Timberwolf that dunked over the Jazz player, and they both got, like, the Jazz player got a concussion or something. And everyone's like, oh, my God, that dunk. Even though we've seen a bunch of dunks, like, this is an extraordinary moment because everybody's like, oh, my God, for NBA, that the NBA games and dunks happen, happen all the time. This is clearly extraordinary. But, like, of course, extraordinary things are going to happen, too. So you'd be a liar if you were like, and it's not just for, it's not just on extraordinary stages like the NBA, you see just in regular life, but it's like people want to make it that the valid extraordinary moments in real life are a tragedy for regular people that aren't like an NBA star. Like tragedy is how you can have a really spectacular thing and then, and we'll praise you for it too. We'll put you on the local news and um, the pilots of commercial airline, commercial airliners that crash will have their names remembered because they'll be on YouTube forever as like this, some, there's a multiple channels retelling when all of the planes crashed and the story of it and the pilot will get their name out there. All the pilots that like died in a plane, uh, in a major plane crash event, get their names remembered generally and but the ones that didn't fuck up don't get remembered at all we reward you for fucking up and for jesus living past your life whatever in the world that we live in it's it's a very critical world very condescending like like wants is ready to is ready to celebrate you for your worst moments like the your fuck up is gonna get the most views in a in a number of cases it's a world that's waiting for you to fuck up and um, because, but maybe it's just like uh, people are becoming less interesting of a technology too. Maybe robots are getting better. So it makes sense to say more and more so that people are not extraordinary. Um, it's just like people are not really, regular people are not given any credit to do. But I guess that's the way that it's gotta be, right? Like, uh, regular people, of course, their only way to get spectacularly ahead is to, like, die spectacularly, because if you're, if you don't have authority over anything spectacular, this world isn't going to praise you for it. Besides, like, besides, like, dying, but dying is spectacular because we hold life in such high regard. Your death is, like, uh chance is a really marquee moment for you. It's a chance for you to get ahead if you want to, if you want to go out with like a mass suicide or whatever, you know, that's an opportunity for you to like really be remembered that people take advantage of because we reward tragedy so often. Like it's probably why school shooters do it is for the infamy and because CNN is going to talk about them endlessly to, um, so, so as to promote their agenda of getting rid of guns. Like, definitely, like, we don't put a streaker on TV in an NFL game because they're must, that must be the most inerrant evil known to man is a streaker on a football field. Somebody who got drunk. This completely horrible, um, irreconcilable behavior, a guy getting drunk and running on a football field. But if somebody shoots up a school, we're going to give them the attention they deserve because not for any reason it's just because there's a lot of unethical bullshitters shitty people in cnn and in 
the establishment and the deep state that care more about an agenda they have than human lives. And uh, so more school shootings will happen as long as we publicize the shit out of every one of them, I, I think is fairly obvious as we see. Because the people that do that are just sick individuals that are looking for, like, know that they don't have any way out to bring significance to their name on a massive scale. Believe me, I know. Like, I, I'm, I'm a regular person with not any enough authority over anything, and that, so I'm like, maybe I should just die or something. I mean, that's what Jim Jones did. Jim Jones got to the end of his rope. He realized that his whole scheme wasn't working. He's, he thought that he could build a socialist utopia and that would be this huge statement to the, to the world um, when he moved everybody to, his, to Jonestown in South America. And um, when it didn't work out, he was like, I, the statement we will have to make is that we will all have to kill ourselves because he's like, he's in too deep and he also s still has complete control over all these people. So he's like, that's what we'll do. Um, so it's like, um, and then it becomes very significant once he does that too. And like we were, that story is remembered forever and ever. Um, I mean, it's only been like 40 years, but it's like that story never gets old to people who like people who are interested in tragedy at some level, like the Jim Jones story is really, um, a memorable, unforgettable thing and, and a statement he made to the world, just like he said he was going to do. Just like he said he was, he was telling his people that the entire time we're going to do something really big for the world. Um, he thought that it would be, we're going to create a socialist utopia and prove that this is possible, but it didn't work out that way because that isn't possible. He just didn't know that because he's ignorant and idealistic, whatever. A lot of, it's not that, uh, really it's like, that's a, such a unique and profound example of a person so rare that will never happen again, probably. Somebody who's able to move a thousand followers to a different continent to pursue this thing that, like, this thing that, like, liberals will talk about. Like, we need a socialist, we need, like, socialist utopia. Like, Jim Jones actually tried to make it happen, which is something that no liberal would ever even attempt to do in real life, like, no liberal would go beyond their words to, like, commit an action that, take anything that seriously, you know? Jim Jones is, like, a guy who takes things very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and do you like the, uh, me blowing my nose on camera? And uh, when it didn't work out, he's like, we're all gonna kill ourselves because he's taking that, like, well, don't forget about that. Dying is an option where we can, then it really will be a thing. If you're willing to go that far. But it's like the the story of that lives on and on. And that's one one way to say that stories should not be um, propagated to the extent that they are. If they're like really horrific, you would have thought. But it's like, why do the horrific ones last so long when... Um, I mean, the ghosts, like, hauntings and whatever surround deaths that were more significant than regular person's deaths. And I don't know. It's almost like, it's like we remember death as much as we remember life. We give, we give just as much credit to some loser that didn't do anything in his life that died in some horrific way as we do to somebody who lived a profound life full of memorable and positive things that they contributed. We're like, that's just as entertaining as somebody who, a, an airplane pilot who killed all of the people on the plane because he was committing suicide. An airplane pilot in, for a company called German Wings did a suicide commercial plane crash where he killed himself and then killed everybody along with him that weren't asking for it. That's a really dirty move, you know. That's not that's not nice, but people will still be like, oh my God, wow, that's horrible, but how interesting. 
People will still watch. People will still love that story, you know? People love the story of... Whatever it is. I'm disgusting, you know? I'm... I uh, blow my nose and... Disgusting person. I might have maligned disgustingness in the last episode. That's not to say that I'm not disgusting, you know. Um, just in general, people are disgusting. Men are disgusting. I would say men are more disgusting than women, as long as we gave women intuition. Uh, disgustingness of it. And my phone is... Uh, I'm trying to save two giant videos on my phone at one time, and so I'm going to have to cut this. I'm going to have to end now. And... Um, I hope you enjoyed my message on preference. It gets, it gets, uh, trying to sort out all the preferences, you know. Preference is very intelligent. That's the point. That's what I'm saying. Preference as a thing, as a character, if you were to consider it as a person, is very intelligent. Um, and intelligence is the future. And you might think that idiocy is the future or we're just getting worse or whatever. No, we're not. Uh, we're getting better. And that's what's pretty much all statistics like quality of life is we're getting better everybody's making more money now than they like the world makes more money a ton more than they did a century ago we're getting better technology is getting better obviously but um and, and there's a more intelligent future preference is very intelligent thank you very much um for listening i appreciate it and i'll have more episodes in the future bye i just shot myself sorry let's shot the audience members this time Everybody should get sh everybody should get shot a little like just I don't want to leave any anybody out like everybody should get a f little bit of uh, gunfire or whatever and um, 